Uh, so I've asked um, uh, Ambassador Shin uh, if he would uh, set the context for us a little bit uh, and give us uh, some perspective on uh, China in Africa, uh, thinking uh, over uh, time, a bit longitudinally, uh, historically, uh, to where we are today with the One Belt, One Road initiative and the recently concluded Party Congress, uh, which we have all watched uh, the news with great interest. Uh, so uh, if he can uh, give us some some opening thoughts about how we might think about uh, China's approach to Africa today uh, and where it's come from vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, uh, its policy towards the continent. Uh, and then we'll ask Dr. Liu uh, uh, to give us uh, some further comments on the Party Congress and developments there. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Lyman, uh, we'll turn to him uh, uh, after that uh, to uh, bridge from that uh, and then think about uh, trilateral cooperation opportunities for us. So, Ambassador Chen. Sure. Thank you, Kate. Uh, very pleased to be with you this morning and, and see such a uh, bright and shiny large group of, uh, of folks who I hope are, are very interested in this topic. L let me put in, in some context um, sort of how China and the United States uh, fit in Africa today, at least from my optic. And I'll do it in the context of what are our respective interests in Africa. And when I talk about interests, I'm talking about hard interests. What do China and the United States want from Africa, not what they can do for Africa? Those are very different things. So I'm going to, to suggest that there are five things that China wants from Africa, and then I'll very quickly do the same thing for the United States. Uh, in the first instance, China wants access to African natural resources. 85% uh, of all African exports to China are oil and minerals or other natural resources. Uh, about 85% of all Chinese exports to Africa are value-added manufactured goods. That's interest number one. Interest number two is China wants the the support, the political support, of as many African countries as it can obtain. Uh, 54 countries in Africa. When I talk about Africa, I use the whole continent. I don't, I don't divide it uh, into Sub-Saharan and North Africa. So China wants the political support of as many of the 54 countries as it can possibly get. China has diplomatic relations with 52 of the 54 countries. Burkina Faso and Swaziland recognize Taiwan. Uh, which leads us to the third interest of China in Africa, and that is to have the diplomatic recognition of all 54 countries. Uh, it would like to see uh, Burkina Faso and Swaziland at some point switch uh, their representation from Taipei to Beijing. So that's interest number three. Uh, interest number four is uh, exporting the maximum amount that it can to African countries because that earns foreign exchange for China. Now the African market in the grand scheme of global trade uh, is not huge for China. It's only about 5% of China's global trade. Nevertheless, 5% is 5% and it would like to increase the amount of exports that it sells to the African countries. The fifth and the last interest that China has in Africa is to avoid all of the potential negative problems that could negatively impact Chinese uh, interests or the Chinese presence in Africa or in the waters around Africa or conceivably even in the Chinese homeland. This is everything from countering terrorism to avoiding international crime, anti-piracy, uh, narcotics trafficking, anything that's bad, that's negative, uh, that could harm uh, Chinese interests or, or personnel in Africa, uh, it wants to avoid. Those are the five things that China wants from Africa. Now, what it can do for Africa is very different in things like economic development and uh, cordial political relations, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't consider those as hard interests. Now, very quickly, what does the U.S. want from Africa? 
Well, uh, it wants access to oil and, uh, to a lesser extent, minerals. Uh, it wants uh, the political support of as many African countries as it can obtain. The U.S. has diplomatic relations with all 54 countries on the continent. Uh, it wants to export as many American products to the continent as it possibly can. Uh, it doesn't have this issue of Taiwan, so that's the one distinction between China's policy and, and U.S. policy that, um, that separates us in terms of what our hard interests are. Uh, the United States also wants to avoid all of the negative issues that I listed in the case of China. Those same negative f factors apply to the United States, and the U.S. wants to make sure those don't impact the United States negatively. And the United States has a, a fifth uh, interest, which China does not yet have, but perhaps which uh, China is approaching, and that is that the U.S. wants to have access to African ports for, its, for U.S. naval vessels. It wants to have the ability to overfly the continent for U.S. military aircraft as necessary, and it wants to be able to land in African uh, airports as necessary in order to support whatever military operations it might have around the world. As I say, I don't think China is at this point yet, even with its new, new uh, uh, facility, military facility, uh, I would argue it's a base in Djibouti. Uh, maybe China will be at this point, at some point in the next 10 years, but not there yet. Yeah, let me just say also generally that the one thing about Africa in terms of the China Africa, or the China-U.S. connection, is that it's essentially neutral territory. Uh, it's the one part of the world where neither the United States nor China has sort of deep core interests, uh, and therefore it makes it a location where there can be cooperation more effectively and, and more easily than in any other part of the world. Uh, Asia is obviously uh, considered to be in the back backyard of uh, China. Latin America is in the backyard of the United States. Uh, Europe is, uh, is closely aligned, uh, for the most part, with the United States. And these are areas that are somewhat more difficult in terms of China-U.S. cooperation. Because Africa is essentially a neutral location, uh, it does, I think, lend itself far more readily to U.S.-China collaboration. And I've made, been making that argument for years, and I continue to believe that is the case. Uh, Kate, I'd be happy to stop there if you wish, and, and uh, there, I haven't really gone into the background of, of the development of, of the China relationship in Africa, but if there's time for that at some point, I'll be happy to do it. But why don't you say a few words on that, uh, just okay. as you see the evolution of China's approach uh, and view towards Africa? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the evolution of China's relationship with Africa is, is um, quite surprising, particularly if you look at the last um, 20 years. When China initially went into Africa in the 1960s and 1970s, it was essentially, uh, during, it was during the Cold War, it was essentially to support African liberation movements, occasionally even to support some uh, very left-wing African um, groups that were trying to topple uh, independent African governments, a very well-documented case in Cameroon, for example, of trying to overthrow the Ahijo government. Uh, so it was a, a very political period, very ideological, very Cold War focused. Now that began to change uh, in the 70s, uh, where China's policy became more pragmatic, and with each passing decade it became more and more pragmatic to the extent that you got to the, the mid-1990s, and China's focus towards Africa uh, changed enormously and became heavily economic, much less political, uh, with, an, with an, a desire to focus on, uh, on trade, uh, to focus on foreign direct investment, to focus on the winning of, of contracts, uh, to build all of these big infrastructure projects in Africa. Uh, clearly an economic focus, and that's, uh, I think, an, uh, represented by these five interests that I just laid out. Uh, China became uh, Africa's largest 
trading partner in 2009, and it has only increased the distance between uh, its trading uh, record with Africa and the number two trader with Africa since 2009. It passed the United States in 2009. Uh, in fact, today, the United States is not even the second largest trading partner with Africa, it's about number four. Uh, India has, uh, has surpassed the United States, and France uh, has passed the United States in terms of bilateral trade. Uh, China is a major uh, source of foreign direct investment in, uh, in Africa today. It's uh, still well behind a number of other uh, Western countries. Its uh, investment flows to Africa are about equal to those of the United States today but American investment stock in Africa is greater than China's, mainly because it's been doing it for a longer period of time. Um, in, in terms of winning contracts, uh, China is way in the lead. Uh, China, Chinese construction companies have basically overwhelmed the rest of the world. Uh, in terms of winning the big infrastructure contracts in Africa, uh, these are, however, based on loans. These are not grants. Uh, for the most part, this is not aid. This is a business deal uh, where Chinese companies come in and build these projects, uh, often with an element of Chinese labor involved. Uh, they, the, the reason that China is winning so many of these contracts, contracts is that it is able to offer financing for them. And the Western countries have not offered financing. So China is effectively filling a void that the West has, um, has given up to China. The, the interesting area in in, in the most recent uh, couple of years in terms of China's engagement in Africa is on the security side. China is clearly taking a greater interest in African security issues and in part, in large part, to protect Chinese interests. And that is why I think you are seeing the development of the first uh, facility that China has ever established outside of China, the military base in Djibouti, uh, which uh, reputedly is to assist its effort at anti-piracy in the Gulf of Aden, but it also has implications beyond that. It's to be available to help evacuation of Chinese nationals if necessary uh, in northeastern Africa, in the, uh, the Gulf state area. Uh, it is to support peacekeeping operations uh, where China has troops uh, assigned to South Sudan, to Darfur. China has about 2,100 troops today assigned to, our, to UN peacekeeping missions in Africa. Uh, these are all important new, relatively new developments in Chinese engagement uh, in security issues in Africa. And I think you're going to see more and more of this as time passes, possibly even with the exception of, or with the, uh, with the addition even of additional uh, military facilities in Africa or in the northern rim of the Indian Ocean in places like um, Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, um, uh, other, other countries along the northern rim of the Indian Ocean. Thank you, Ambassador Shen. Um, Dr. Liu, uh, maybe we can uh, have your comment on um, uh, where you see political developments in China going, uh, this very uh, significant party congress that just concluded, uh, and uh, whether that uh, uh, portends any changes that we would expect uh, in terms of uh, China's current approach uh, towards Africa, uh, its uh, um, um, relatively newer interest in security uh, on the continent, and in fact, um, it's uh, uh, from my own uh, very uh, brief observation. Uh, it's uh, uh, increasing um, uh, focus on uh, norms of global governance. Uh, in fact, uh, from uh, at least where I heard uh, uh, the Chinese conversation some ten years or so ago uh, on the development and security side, uh, China is increasingly espousing uh, the kinds of global norms that uh, 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 the United States uh, uh, used to talk about, uh, still talks about. Yeah, uh, but uh, we hear the Chinese voice coming stronger. Uh, what, what does uh, President Xi Jinping's uh, approach uh, say for us? Thanks, uh, uh, Kate, for invitation. Uh, Ambassador Xin just gave a historical overview uh, of what U.S. and China wants from Africa, as well as the evolution of China's uh, policy toward Africa. So I want to talk about the present. You know, they just uh, concluded uh, 19th uh, Party Congress. Uh, 
I mean, for the outsiders, you know, the, the Congress sometimes uh, appear to be very mysterious. You know, you don't know what really happened. And of course, uh, domestically, uh, you know, China has entered a, a new era of political uncertainty because there is no successor identified. So that, for a lot of people, that's the most important thing. In the next five years, you know, who is going to be the next leader? Usually, in the past 15, 20 years, you know who is going to be the next one. But right now, we don't know. Maybe we'll have President Xi around for a much longer time. But more than that, I, I think in terms of the context of China-Africa relationship, this is also a very important uh, Congress. Uh, one of the things you know, President Xi and others emphasize is the so-called concept of a new era. China has entered a new era. What does that mean? Now, if you look at you know, Ambassador Xin talk about history. So Mao, Mao Zedong, you know, Africans love him probably, is associated with Chinese people rising up. So that's the first era. And then we move on to the more pragmatic era, Deng Xiaoping, and that is when Chinese have become richer. You know, Deng really liberated the Chinese uh, so that they can enrich themselves. Now the new era means China is coming out of the door. Actually, it's bursting out of the door and becoming, quote unquote, a superpower. So she has get China to be powerful. So they have defined this new era is China is more powerful. Now, what does that mean China is more powerful? China is more powerful because China wants to engage the world more. So what does that mean? You know, if you read uh, the, the political report, you know, three and a half hours long that he delivered standing up without even drinking a sip of water. You know, that shows how strong he is. But really what he said over there, he said, you know, China wanted to be a contributor uh, to global development. China wanted to be a builder of world peace. And China wants to be a defender of global order. Uh, as, as Kate mentioned, is that you know China is not shying away uh, from what the British and the Americans have done in the past few months. You know the Brexit, and then America first, and China is saying no, we're not going to do that. We benefited from globalization. We're not a free rider. Now it's our turn to contribute. You know to sustain uh, that that order. Now, secondly, is the OBOR uh, that uh, Kate mentioned in her uh, introductory remarks. And again, you know, OBOR, this is President Xi's concept. I mean, there are lots of other people say we already invented this before he formally uh, adopted. Uh, but o OBOR, OBOR is one belt, one road. Yeah, the one belt, one road, uh, sometimes also known as Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. I think the Chinese government is adopting more and more BRI. Now, uh, that, I think, if you talk to Chinese diplomat, you know, or you talk to Chinese business people, sometimes they talk about different things. You know, for the business people, is that means the overcapacity has to be exported to other countries. You know, for example, steel, cement, construction companies that was mentioned by Ambassador Xin. But for diplomats and for scholars, you know, there's more to BRI. And that is China has been able to uh, alleviate poverty in the country. China has been able to develop its economy. Is there such a thing called China model? And is that model suitable to be replicated in other parts of the world. So you talk to Chinese diplomats and some scholars, they say this is really about exporting the Chinese model. And of course, one place where they want to test whether this model is going to work or not is Africa. You know, we are able to do so. You know, can we talk to the Africans and see if they are able to do the same thing, to grow economically and also to stabilize uh, politically. So there, there is this desire uh, on the part of the Chinese. So it's not all just selfish. You know, th there is this stronger uh, desire that, you know, as a, a superpower, as you assume more responsibility, you really want to do more. You want to provide more uh, public goods. 
One other thing that was uh, mentioned in the report, I think it will have huge implication on China's policy toward Africa, is uh, when he talked about the new concept of national security, he said, you know, national security is not just about territorial security, it is also about safety of Chinese citizens. Now, there are lots of Chinese now that are working, living, making money, doing other things in Africa. Now, to protect the safety of Chinese citizens in Africa, now we have French Howard, a former New York Times reporter, who wrote a book called Africa is China's Second Continent. You know, the number of Chinese living in Africa is growing. Now, how are we going to extend protection to those people? So I think that will have a huge implication on that. Lastly, uh, what I want to say uh, is uh, a FOCAC. You know, 2015, the FOCAC was a summit. It was held uh, in uh, South Africa, in Johannesburg. Now, it's going back to China this year. And we heard, because we just came back from China, the FOCAC meeting this year is again going to be a summit. It was already decided by President Xi. And uh, the question is where this is going to be held. And there is speculation this is going to be held at his hometown city, which is also my city, is Xi'an. Because if you look at where the big international meetings were held in the past few years, one was held in Hangzhou, in eastern China, where she was the provincial governor. It was then the, the BRICS summit was held in Xiamen, where she was the mayor there. Now it's going to move uh, to his hometown city, which means a lot of money. But uh, I, I mentioned this is the de deliverables. You know, now the 19th Party Congress, President Xi is talking about, you know, we want to assume more responsibility. Now, this is where your responsibility is going to be highlighted to the world. So I, I think this is a good opportunity for all the people here, as well in the US and in China, to think about if trilateral collaboration uh, will be one of the deliverables uh, at the FOCAC meeting. I'll stop here. And, and Dr. Liu, um, FOCAC 2015, if I recall correctly, had an astounding uh, uh, promise, a commitment of investment uh, for Africa. Uh, yeah, that figure was 160 billion. 60 billion. Right. Okay, I was going to say 160 billion. No, 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 60, 60 billion. Not oh, oh, 60. Right. Okay. Yeah, still astounding. Six zero billion uh, uh, in U.S. dollar equivalent, right? Uh, uh, the commitment. Um, did has have we seen much of that uh, executed yet? Uh, from your observation. I think uh, Chinese leaders, uh, and, and particularly those who work under the leaders, like to drop numbers. But the, the, the challenge is you know, figure out where that money is and how that money is, is spent. So we, we don't know. I think you go to the, 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 the development bank, or you go to import-export bank, you go to Ministry of Commerce, you know, you'll be able to find you know, where that money is. For example, the, the 100 million uh, that President Xi uh, initially pledged uh, uh, September uh, 2015. Finally, you know, uh, a month ago, we heard you know, that money was going to go to African Union to build up an African peacekeeping standby force as well as a quick uh, reaction force. So that's where the money is going to spend, at, at least. And uh, another question is, who is going to spend the money? You know, the money is earmarked. You know, is it going to be the Ministry of Commerce or is it going to be the Defense Ministry, the military? Now it looks like that 100 million uh, for peacekeeping purposes is going to be controlled and, and budgeted and spent by the Chinese military in conjunction uh, uh, working with uh, African Union. I think what makes Johannesburg summit uh, more extraordinary than just dropping the numbers in terms of aids and assistance to Africa or economic growth is uh, President Xi asked African heads of state whether China wants to engage Africa on peace and security matters. So the Chinese diplomat who were present at those meetings said, you know, more than uh, 40, 50 percent of the African heads of state said, yes, we want China to be more engaged on peace and security. But I, I think this is coming from Africa directly is, is very important because China has always say, we don't mess 
with domestic affairs of other countries. We, we don't want to get involved in elections. We don't want to get involved uh, in local uh, civil strife, and we don't want to uh, get involved in any of that. But now China is now being asked by African leaders to say, you know, you need to engage more on peace and security matters. So uh, I think that distinguishes the Johannesburg summit from the pre previous ones. It's more a deepening political involvement uh, on the part of China in Africa. And then uh, two more quick questions. Uh, one, just to, to draw the distinction in, in uh, our government institutions in the United States, uh, there is uh, no equivalent to, to the U.S. Agency for International Development in the Chinese government. Is, is that a correct way to understand? Where, where does foreign assistance to Africa come from institutionally within the Chinese government? Uh, I think Ambassador Xin uh, probably knows a lot more. Uh, we, we also try to figure this out. So their uh, Ministry of foreign, foreign Affairs, they talk about foreign aid, and the money will come from Ministry of Finance, but the spending of the money is actually Ministry of Commerce. Right. And of course, you know, there is a conflict of interest of Ministry of Commerce. You know, you're really dealing with commercial affairs. You know, are you serious about foreign aid? And it's a very small uh, department, you know, it's just no comparison to USAID. And there's growing call among Chinese scholars and the researchers that China needs to have an equivalent of a USAID. So I, I think maybe this is going to come out soon if China really is going to assume more responsibility and provide more public goods to the world. And, and then um, just lastly, do you, uh, is there anything we should be watching for in this next summit uh, in terms of key, is the key theme uh, of it known yet or uh, any ideas where the focus uh, will, will be for the next FOCAC? I, I think what we're going to watch for, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the, the deliverables and particularly how China is going to engage Africa more on peace and security. And, you know, since we, we can talk about this more, but my general uh, impression, you know, having made a trip during the Party Congress to China on trilateral cooperation issues is the Chinese foreign ministry is actually very reluctant to, to engage on peace and security matters in Africa. You know, when we were there, and, and you know, the director general, uh, Minister, Mr. Tai Bin basically said, you know, can you just tell us which African countries are receptive to U.S.-China working together on peace and security matters. I mean, in other words, he's also saying which African country will specifically ask China to, to work on peace and security matters in Africa. So I, I think that, but uh, on the opposite side is the Chinese military with the, the military base that Ambassador Shane just uh, mentioned in Djibouti just become uh, becoming operational. They seem to be very eager. You know, I think in in uh, in our conversation uh, there, they said, uh, you know, because China has peacekeeping training centers in China. Now they say we talk to the European unions. We wonder if Americans and Africans will be receptive to the idea to set up a peacekeeping training center in Djibouti or in any of the African countries. When the country invites China to do so. So there are this, you know, really going out uh, attitude and mentality. So I, I think from now to uh, later next year, when, when the summit is going to be held, is uh, how these uh, different departments and, you know, how they're going to implement the, the 19 party Congress international agenda. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Liu. Yeah, that's a, a perfect pivot, I think, to Ambassador Lyman uh, and uh, uh, Princeton, your perspective on uh, how not just Chinese engagement in Africa has changed, but uh, uh, the dance of the United States and China uh, in Africa together, uh, where we've had uh, uh, successes in uh, cooperating on peace and security on the continent, uh, what the opportunities and uh, perhaps uh, some of the impediments uh, to going forward might still be. And um, uh, for Further uh, uh, um, uh, tweak on the question: uh, democracy. Uh, democracy didn't really come up in uh, the discussion uh, so much of uh, Chinese interests on the continent, uh, uh, but uh, also where does that fall vis-a-vis -vis American interests, and and how does our difference on the point of democracy come into this trilateral cooperation discussion?
Well, um, excuse me. <clears throat> thank you, Kate, and uh, thank you all for having us come spe speak with you today. And let me pick up on on what my colleagues have said. And let me start with a, a, a an important concept, which isn't universally recognized in the United States, but I think by most people who deal with the issue of China in the United States and Africa, and that is that we are not we are not in strategic competition in Africa. That is, our strategic interests are not threatened by the competition in Africa. Uh, China isn't going to gobble up all the minerals uh, and, and some of the other extreme things. We are competitors, though. We are competitors for political influence. We are competitors in the economic field. China doesn't uh, work by the same rules as we do on economics, etc. Uh, so, you, seeing it as competition with areas of cooperation is the way it seems to me to, to look at uh, the relationship of the United States and Africa. Now, uh, David has, and both uh, Yahweh has also talked about the evolution of Chinese thinking about how they protect their own interests in Africa, particularly their investments and their personnel. It was traumatic for China to have to evacuate, and I, I forget the figure, David. 36,000 36, Chinese from Libya when the Gaddafi regime collapsed. And, and that was traumatic, that they suddenly were responsible for 36,000 Chinese in Africa, and they had to get them out. And uh, so the China has become more concerned about, as my colleagues have said, stability and security on the continent, not just for Africa's sake, but to protect their own interests. Now, we saw that when I was working as envoy for Sudan and South Sudan, uh, when the uh, South Sudan was separating from Sudan, and a lot of issues and a lot of tension existed between the two countries. One of the big differences was how to divide the oil industry between the two. China is a 40% owner of the, China, of the uh, Sudan, South Sudan oil industry, had a big influence, etc. And China was concerned about a peaceful separation of the two countries. And we found that we could work together in a number of ways through that process that went on for over two years. China was extremely helpful in educating the parties about how the oil industry worked, because there were some people coming, particularly from South Sudan, that had no experience in managing the industry. Uh, uh, they were helpful in messaging on peace and uh, peaceful resolution. There were areas that China would not go in that. And, and the, for example, China is a major arms exporter to Sudan. They never were prepared to use that as leverage with Khartoum when Khartoum was being obstinate or particularly aggressive in the negotiations. So there were lines we couldn't cooperate on. There were other lines in which we cooperated well. The other thing is that China preferred to work their diplomacy more or less individually rather than as a number of other envoys we worked as a group, we and the British and the, and the, and the, and the Norwegians and, and, and others. China preferred to consult with us, but also to act individually. So it was a different style. There were limits on, on where they were willing to go. But on the whole, because our interests converged, we wanted a peaceful separation. We wanted a resolution of those most difficult issues. We had common, common interests, and we worked very well together. That has continued in the um, problems of South Sudan's civil war, where China has become even more active and more visible in the negotiations being carried out by EGAD. Uh, they're not major players right now in it, but they're more visible than they would have been before because they hold that oil industry together. Their workers are keeping the pumps going in South Sudan. They're very worried about the safety of those Chinese. They have a peacekeeping mission uh, there, the only combat mission, by the way, that they have in UN peacekeeping. Uh, and so they have a stake in what happens in South Sudan that is the same as we in terms of overall objectives. Now, uh, let me turn to 
other areas of both convergence and differences. We have talked, and I participate uh, with the Carter Center's uh, Africa-China-US Consultation for Peace, and we have looked at uh, collaboration not only in the Horn of Africa, but we've looked at maritime security in, in on the uh, western, uh, off the western coast of Africa. We've looked at Lake Chad Basin, et cetera. Now there are areas where cooperation is is possible and and is advanced in some areas. That is, for example, on maritime security uh, in West Africa, uh, better uh, information about who's doing what, uh, how the training that we're each doing in that area uh, uh, is coordinated or complementary, etc. But there are areas where the Chinese won't go. And one of them is the issue of illegal fishing off the west coast of Africa, in which they are major players. And you can't get that on the agenda. They are actually very bad on environmental development of the timber industry in Africa. They've been cited by the World Bank over and over again. These are areas, frankly, that if we raise in our consultation meetings are really no-go areas. And they are serious areas for Africa. Uh, and, and, the, and again, it's a sign of, of limits uh, and differences within the, the government of China as to where their interests lie. So I, I made that point that there are areas of cooperation and there are lines where we differ very sh significantly and where it's really in the hands of the African countries to take up those issues which the Chinese will not work with us and where the Chinese, African countries must take up the environmental issues, the depletion of the fishing resources, uh, et cetera. Um, the, the question that Kate raises, one of the areas that is different about our approach to Africa to China, and David touched on this as well, is the United States for a long time uh, has a, a different model, if you will, in mind uh, that uh, uh, advocates that a democratic uh, government and free markets and respect for human rights is the right model for development, both in moral terms and economic terms. China for a long time said, we don't interfere in those areas. Uh, business is business, politics is politics, and we're here for business. Not a very Marxist comment, but um, but now, as, as, as Yahweh has said, uh, there is some pride in what's called the Chinese model. And the Chinese model is different. It doesn't emphasize democracy. It emphasizes a very strong role for the state in development. And I think Ethiopia is a good example of a country that has tried to copy the Chinese model, although running into some very, very serious problems uh, along the way. Now, how that will play out in our respective policies is a little hard to see because the Trump administration has not put the same emphasis on democracy and human rights uh, as previous American administrations. We'll just have to see. It's still a strong issue with our Congress. If you notice a Congress resolution on human rights in Ethiopia, uh, strong support for the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, an American institution that supports democracy abroad. So it it will still be a, 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 an issue and a question uh, between us. What China has to face is how stable and secure will African countries be if they are not democratic, if there are serious violations of human rights. Uh, and, and that leads to instability and threatens the very interests in which China is involved. Uh, it's an area they haven't wanted to go down this, yeah, this far, but I think it's an issue that will constantly come up. Uh, and again, it will be for the African countries to state where their priorities are and, and, and not assume that the, either the Chinese model or the American model has to be the model that, that African countries follow. <clears throat> now, there's another area in which I think Africans have to be both appreciative and, and, and a little bit careful. And that is, China is making a major contribution in infrastructure development in Africa. There's no question about it. We went out of that business in USAID 
I think I presided in the 1970s when I was in USAID over the last aid-funded highway project in Africa. We got out of that business. We went to health and, and, and humanitarian assistance and agriculture, etc. So China has made major contributions, but there's two things to be careful about. One is debt. As David pointed out, these are financed projects by China, and they in their acquiring debt. And Africa, which went through a terrible debt crisis in the 1980s, as you know, uh, and got out of a lot of its debt, a lot of it rescheduled or eliminated, and now beginning to build that debt up again. And Chinese are a significant part of that. And I think African countries have to be very careful because debt is not only an economic liability, it can become a political liability. So I think, again, here, one has to be careful. One has to be careful about the transparency of the contracts and the, and the deals that are being made. They're not always transparent. And I think, again, African countries have to say, wait a minute, we can't, if, the, if that's the case, have our institutions corrupted by, by deals that are not transparent and which may not be uh, what they should be. Uh, and finally, the quality of the construction uh, going on is now coming, uh, raising some questions. Uh, and again, you want to look at that in terms of standards of building construction, road construction, etc., to be sure that you, that Africa is getting uh, these things. This is not to say that China is not making a major contribution. They are, but it's very important to look at how that is being uh, done uh, in, in Africa. Finally, let me come to the security area. We share the United States, Africa, uh, China, concerned over security. Uh, Yahweh is exactly right. Uh, African countries have uh, been more open to collaboration uh, internationally on security than I think in, in, in my time uh, with the expansion of American military presence on the continent, uh, with African invitation, uh, the expansion of the role of the uh, uh, our operations out of Djibouti, and as you've seen in the press a great deal, uh, American presence in Sahel, uh, and this with the support of the African Union and with the invitation of the countries involved because those security problems are real. Um, China has, a, has an interest in that as well, has pledged money to build up Africa's peacekeeping uh, capacity, uh, contributes to UN peacekeeping operations, etc. But we don't collaborate actively together on on any of these campaigns we're not we're not working hand in glove on let's say the problems of terrorism in the sahel etc and i think that would be difficult to do and i'm not sure that African countries always want us to be working collaboratively because sometimes African countries prefer to deal with one and deal with the other and keep them a little separate and maybe play off one against the other. That's natural, but it, it means that the African countries are really in the decision-making point of how much collaboration they really want. But I think in the security area, there's a great deal of opportunity for frank and continuing discussions between African countries, China, ourselves, the European Union, on this whole range of security issues that are now engulfing the Sahel, uh, the, the uh, problems in the Horn, etc., to see if we can evolve into a more uh, common view, if not common program, of how to address it. Um, if you look at the demographics in Africa, I can't, I, people will say, and I agree, that the pressure of migration to Europe is going to continue for many years to come. This is an issue for Europe, and it affects the security. And the European Union is responding, as you know, with various programs in Africa trying to stop the migrants before they, they leave. But that's, that's a, 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 it's not going to solve the basic problem. Uh, so you have a, a, a demographic process at work, you have uh, development issues, uh, you have political governance issues, 
uh, and all of them bear on the security. And we're dealing with them all a little bit differently. The European Union with its program, the U.S. with the stepped-up military presence in Africa and support to, to peacekeeping, uh, and the Chinese doing some peacekeeping, uh, et cetera, but not necessarily getting involved in some of those larger issues. I think that's an area for conversation, uh, not to expect that we're all going to be on the same wavelength in every country, but if we don't look at that more holistically, and again, I look to the Africans to push this dialogue, to say, wait a minute, it isn't just a military response that's going to work here, and it isn't just getting Libyan militias to stop people at the border. There's something more fundamental we all have to talk about, and then I think we can get much more collaboration, because these are areas of security and future uh, uh, stability in Africa in which China, the U.S., and Africa all have a common interest. So let me stop there. Uh, thank you, uh, Princeton, for uh, putting those issues on the table. I think uh, there's a, a lot to, to react to and to comment on. I just want to see if uh, David or, or Yahweh, you'd like to uh, make a further uh, uh, thought uh, before we open it up uh, to the audience based on uh, Ambassador Lyman's uh, points on convergence and divergence for trilateral cooperation. Yeah, let me follow up on one point, which I, I fully agree with, that, uh, that Princeton made. Uh, I'll state it in a slightly different context, but it essentially comes out the same, to the same thing. To, to the extent that the African countries would like to see collaboration on security issues between China and the United States, or for that matter, between Europe and China and the United States, or any, any combination of non-African partners of Africa, it's critical that the initiative come from the Africans, that it be driven by the Africans. That signals to the partners, Americans, Chinese, Europeans, whoever they are, that we, the Africans, are interested in that. And that also encourages all the parties to take it seriously. If, if the United States goes to China and says, oh, let's go talk to the Africans about collaborating on, on dealing with uh, piracy in the Gulf of uh, Guinea, um, the Africans are almost immediately uh, suspicious. Uh, it's sort of China and the U.S. ganging up on, on the Africans, and they're not so sure that's the right, way, the right thing to do. But if, if African countries in the Gulf of Guinea get together and say, gee, we really need help, and we think that the, the Chinese, the Americans, and the Europeans can, can help us in this, let's go to them then something is likely to happen, uh, both from the American side and the Chinese side and perhaps the European side. And I think that's an absolutely critical distinction to make. Um, and I think it's, it's important that the Africans think through where are the areas of cooperation and where do they not exist? There clearly is commercial competition between the United States and China in Africa. We're going to compete for trade. We're going to compete for foreign direct investment. Um, those are not easy areas for collaboration because by nature they are competitive, just as they are competitive with the Europeans. We compete with France, with Germany, with the United Kingdom on these issues. But when it comes to security issues, there are areas that are uh, that that both the China and the United States can collaborate on, and are in the interest of the Africans to have that collaboration, and where competition is not really an issue, but it's up to the Africans to figure out which issues these are, and then to raise them uh, at a high levels and forcefully with the uh, the partner governments. So just to add what uh, Ambassador Shin just said is, uh, you know, since we started uh, this uh, trilateral consultation for peace and prosperity project at the Carter Center, we constantly heard uh, from the China side, you know, if you want us to engage on peace and security matters, that will have to come directly from African countries. So in this last trip, uh, we brought ICC uh, Executive Director, Inter-Regional uh, Coordination Committee, as well as the uh, Secretary General of Lake Chad Basin Commission to go with us. So at each and every meeting, they presented uh, that they want to see U.S.-China collaboration, and then they have a wish list that they want the China to do. The Chinese Foreign Ministry always said, everything will have to originate from the embassy in a particular country. You know, when we were in uh, Lome, Togo, you know, 
the Chinese ambassador said, you know, we already contributed uh, to, to the piracy. We give ships. Uh, and the American ambassador also said, we also offered material support. But then the issue is U.S. and China, they don't share uh, information. They don't coordinate. I think that's what Ambassador Lyman is so right, is that you know, even if you're not going to work together on these issues, at least you know you want to get into a conversation in terms of what U.S. and China, you know, if not cooperate, can they really complement each other? You know, we we did a paper on uh, eradication of malaria in Africa. China is doing so much, U.S. is doing so much, but we have never found any evidence that the two sides are actually talking to each other lessons to be learned and positive experience to be to be shared you know on peacekeeping it's the same thing i think china now is earnest uh, in saying we really want to work with the us on peacekeeping training china is the largest uh, contributor of troops the us is the largest contributor of financial support but they don't talk to each other in terms what is happening on the ground. Uh, also, uh, there is the issue of uh, uh, European Union. Uh, so I, I don't think you know, talking about trilateral collaboration is going to be very uh, pleasant uh, to the European Union. Uh, I think there was a Gulf of Guinea meeting uh, in London that was held last uh, earlier this year. And uh, the, the French and, and the others are very resistant to the idea that you know, China has nothing to do uh, with these things and uh, we're, we're not going to work with, with China. So instead of just trilateral, maybe we should make it multilateral and get all the stakeholders uh, to, to come together. And uh, so I, again, I, I want to, uh, and also lastly, I think is the asymmetrical feature of U.S. military and the Chinese military. If we're talking about military to military collaboration. So on the U.S. side, we'll have a four-star general, we'll have AFRICOM. And uh, uh, the commander, General uh, Wodhauser, uh, delivered a powerful speech September the 13th at the USIP. I think his voice is, a, is a, a, a long and lonely voice in the American military establishment to say what China is doing in Africa is positive. We have shared interests in Africa. U.S. and China should collaborate in Africa. You know, that's what he said on September the 13th, here in D.C., not too far from here. Now, on the China side, we don't have an African command. And, and the, you know, if U.S. military wants to engage China, I mean, the only place they go is they go to the Office of International Military Cooperation, which doesn't really have any policy-making capacity. So you're literally talking to someone who can only relay your concern or your uh, interest you know, to whoever is going to make that decision. So I think institutionally, particularly on the China side, you know, they, they need to do a little bit more, such as USAID, you know, African Command, you know, which are all absent from the, from the China side. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to the panel uh, for helping to unpack uh, this uh, uh, complex and dynamic uh, 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 set of uh, issues around uh, China and the United States' uh, engagement uh, in Africa.